my name is Nicolas Paperno. I'm a PhD student at Penn State University. And um, today I'm going to present some of the work I did while interning at uh, Google Brain on private machine learning. So this is joint work with uh, Martin Abadi, Olvar Erlingson, Ian Goodfellow, and Kunal Talwar. So in many applications, uh, for instance, financial or medical applications, performing machine learning involves some data that may be sensitive. And so in this uh, work, we're going to uh, present an approach uh, for learning these machine learning models with uh, different notions of privacy guarantees that I'm going to present uh, in the next few slides. So before we begin, uh, I'd like to motivate the problem of uh, privacy in machine learning by giving you two examples of a text that have been presented uh, in the security literature. So the first one uh, is called training data extraction attacks uh, or model inversion attacks. Uh, basically imagine that you have a classifier trained on uh, images of uh, faces of individuals uh, to recognize which individual is uh, in the image. So for instance, you would feed the classifier these uh, headshots and uh, the output of the class by the person in the image. So Fredrickson and Al showed that with access to the classifier's output probabilities, they were able to reconstruct uh, these images here, which are approximative uh, approximations of uh, the training data that the machine learning classifier saw. So here it's uh, important to note that these approximations are not extracting individual training points, but rather the average representation that the classifier learned for each class, which here uh, corresponds to one individual. In this second attack here uh, from last year called membership inference attacks, the goal of the adversary is slightly different. Instead of reconstructing uh, training points uh, from the output of the classifier, the goal is now to infer whether a specific training point was, a specific input was used uh, to train the model. So given an image of uh, a person here, for instance, did uh, this person contribute to the training data uh, from a specific machine learning model? And again, uh, Chakri and Al showed that you can uh, perform these attacks uh, by only having access to the classifier's probabilities. So in our work, we would like to provide guarantees uh, for the uh, strongest types of adversaries. So really we want to uh, be able to defend against uh, very powerful attackers. So this is why we consider two types of threat models, uh, black box and white box adversaries, um, which sort of characterize well the, the space of attackers. So in the first uh, case, the adversary is only able to query the model that you trained. So the adversary doesn't really have access to the internals of the model, to the architecture, to the parameters. All it can do is submit inputs to your black box model and observe the prediction that the model is making. Uh, so this is called uh, model querying attacks or black box attacks. And the two attacks that I presented in the previous slides are instances of such attacks. The second uh, threat model is much stronger. Uh, in this case, the adversary has access to the model and its parameters. In some recent uh, work, uh, from Zhang and Al uh, from last year uh, called Understanding Deep Learning and Christ Rethinking Generalization um, sort of hints at the fact that machine learning models might be able to memorize some of their training data, or at least they have the capacity to do so. So really would like to be robust to an attacker that has access to these model parameters and can analyze them. So this is why in our work, uh, our threat model assumes 
uh, very powerful adversaries, which can make a potentially unbounded number of queries and also have access to the model internals. So before we get started, it's also important to define what we mean by privacy. Because there are many ways that one could define privacy, but in uh, our case, we used uh, sort of the gold standard for uh, defining privacy, which is called differential privacy. So the definition of differential privacy can be understood pretty uh, intuitively uh, by considering two different worlds. So in one world, uh, your data is uh, in the world, and in the second world, you do not exist. So this is, for instance, here on this row, you have this first world where this row of the data is basically what you contributed as a person to the data set. And in this second database, uh, your data has been removed. So you don't exist in the second world. And what differential privacy uh, requires is that um, as the defender, if you run your randomized algorithm on these two different data sets, so these two worlds, the answers that your uh, randomized algorithm, so in our case, the machine learning model, uh, will produce here, the answers will be statistically indistinguishable to, a, to an observer. So here, the, the attacker is not able to infer whether uh, my data was included or not included uh, in the input of the randomized algorithm. And this uh, guarantees privacy uh, in an intuitive way. So this is what our approach uh, is designed to provide differential privacy protection guarantees. But in addition to that, we also provide an even more intuitive uh, notion of privacy, which I will explain uh, in the next uh, couple of slides. And also one of our design uh, goals was to have a generic uh, approach, which means that our framework should be applicable to any type of uh, learning algorithm. It shouldn't be restricted uh, to, for instance, deep neural networks. We would like to be able to use support vector machines or decision trees. And this is a key distinction uh, with a lot of the previous work uh, in this area of private machine learning. Our approach is called uh, pâté, uh, which should be pronounced like the French food, and which more seriously stands for the private aggregation of teacher ensembles. Um, here's sort of an overview of the approach. So you begin by considering the sensitive data here on the left, and you partition it into n subsets of data here. So these are partitions, which means that there is no overlap uh, between two uh, given partitions. So if my data was included in the sensitive data set here, it would only be, for instance, in partition two. Uh, I would not have any data uh, in the other partitions. And so on each of these partitions here, we're going to train a teacher. And a teacher is basically any machine learning model that we'd like to train um, on this type of data. And so we just train one, one different model for each partition. So we, we have here an ensemble of teachers where each teacher was trained independently on different uh, training data here, a different partition. And really, I'd like to stress that we can use any type of machine learning approach here. So for instance, we could use deep neural networks if, if we'd like to. And so instead uh, of using these teachers individually, uh, at prediction time at inference, we're going to aggregate their predictions uh, and have them answer collectively. So a very simple strategy that probably comes to mind for a lot of people is basically you consider the set of classes. So remember we're considering classification problems. So we know we have maybe six possible outputs. We just count the label, the number of labels assigned by the teachers in each of these classes. So maybe 10 teachers voted for this class, 20 teachers voted for this class, and so on. And then we would just return the class here that got assigned the maximum number of votes. So this would uh, provide some sort of intuitive notion of privacy because if uh, the, the aggregated answer 
uh, is output, it means that there is a majority of teachers that agreed on the prediction. So you can understand that this prediction did not depend on any specific uh, partitions of data. And so it does not depend on any uh, user that contributed to the sensitive data. However, there are some uh, edge cases where uh, changing the predictions of one teacher uh, might change the outcome of the aggregation uh, mechanism. And so this is this, this type of scenario here, um, where instead of having this overwhelming majority here, where one class is clearly, uh, most of the teachers agree on one class here, we have this sort of more complex situation where there are a couple classes that have similar numbers of votes. And so if we uh, output the majority here, for instance, this class, changing a few votes uh, for the, for changing, for instance, the predictions of one teacher might change the order of these bars. And maybe instead of this one being bigger, this one is going to be bigger. There is just by changing one or two votes, you can change the order of uh, the classes. And so this would change the output of the mechanism. So to prevent sort of these edge cases, uh, we, we have an additional step before we take the maximum we add Laplacian noise uh, to the mechanism. And so this sorts of introduces some randomness, which protects the privacy of users uh, when the teachers do not have a strong quorum and the teachers don't overwhelmingly agree on the same label. And the reason we choose the Laplacian distribution is that it makes analysis easier because the Laplace di distribution is commonly used in uh, the differentially private literature uh, to provide these privacy guarantees. Uh, and I'll come back to that later. So here, if we look, uh, if we take a step back at our approach, we have this, this whole mechanism here, which can produce the output of the aggregated teachers is basically a differentially private API. So we can ask questions to the aggregated teacher and we can uh, return uh, predictions with uh, differential privacy. However, it would be nice if we were able to train a machine learning model so that instead of uh, producing an API, we would have a machine learning model that we can use to make predictions uh, on the data. So this is sort of the last step of our approach where we are going to transfer the knowledge from this teacher ensemble into a final student model using some public data. So here the assumption is that the public data is uh, completely unlabeled. Um, and so we have to get some labels for it in order to be able to train this student model. And we're going to uh, basically use it to transfer the knowledge from the teachers by asking the teachers to label some of this public data and then the student will have access to a training set, which it can use to learn a model. And so there are really two reasons why we'd like to train a student model uh, from the privacy standpoint. So the first is that if we stick to the first part of the mechanism where we only have the teachers, every time the teachers make a prediction, uh, we pay an additional cost in privacy. So overall, uh, as users make more and more prediction queries, the, the overall cost in terms of privacy will keep increasing. So at some point we'll have a tension between utility and privacy. The second reason is that if you remember our threat model, we considered adversaries which uh, are able to access the internals of the models, uh, which means that if uh, the adversary is able to uh, inspect the internals of the teachers, because the teachers saw the training data, they may be able to uh, leak some information about that training data. Whereas if the adversary instead inspects the student model, then um, it will only be able to recover in the worst case, the public data with the labels that were provided by the teacher with differential privacy. So this is the final approach and uh, during during inference, when we're 
making predictions, we don't need to keep the teachers or the training data. We can discard, discard all, all of it safely and just keep the student as our inference model. The way that we prove that our approach provides differential privacy is based on an application of the moments accountant, which is a technique introduced by some of my co-authors in 2016. And the moments accountant uh, technique, I'm not going to go into the details, but on a high level, you can sort of uh, take away that the moments accountant technique allows us to formalize uh, the fact that when we have a strong quorum among the teachers, when all of the teachers or most of the teachers agree, then we should pay a small privacy cost for that prediction uh, given to the student. And so um, the guarantees that we provide here in terms of differential privacy are uh, data dependent, meaning that we, during training, we record all of the votes uh, provided by the teachers and we uh, compute uh, numerical values for the differential privacy guarantees uh, provided. So here, in a sense, uh, differential privacy is characterized by two values, epsilon and delta, uh, in the variant of differential privacy that we use in this work. So epsilon is the value uh, which uh, basically defines an interval uh, which uh, quantifies how much we tolerate uh, the output of the machine learning model on one database uh, to be different from the output of the same machine learning model on a second database D prime that only has one training point that is different. So the smaller epsilon is, uh, the stronger privacy will be. And delta here is a failure rate at which we tolerate the uh, guarantee to not hold. So I'll come back to this in the experimental section. So now I'm going to um, present a sort of a generative variant of pate, which you can think of as a more fancy version of the approach. Uh, and then I'll move on to the experimental results. So Pate G uses uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, which are a framework uh, introduced by Ian Goodfellow in 2014, where uh, two models are trained in a game. Uh, so there are two models are competing against each other. The first model is a generator. So it takes random noise and uh, tries to output uh, inputs that appear to be from the training distribution. Um, and the discriminator is instead trying to distinguish inputs that were produced by the generator uh, from real inputs from the training distribution. In our work, we use a slight variant of this framework uh, adapted for semi-supervised learning uh, introduced by Salomon Zanal in uh, 2016, where the discriminator is slightly more complicated. Instead of just uh, trying to distinguish real from fake inputs, when the input is believed to be real, the discriminator also has to provide the correct class for that input. And so this allows us to use it as a classifier. So what we do here is uh, in this in in the Pate G framework, we replace the student by the generator and discriminator models, and uh, we train uh, the these two models on the public data again, which only a subset of is labeled by the aggregated teacher, and at inference time, uh, we only keep the discriminator because that's the model that can make predictions. Um, so the generator is only used uh, to benefit from the unlabeled data and to help the discriminator uh, to learn from this unlabeled data. So I'm going to finish with an overview of the experimental results that we got in the Pate paper. Uh, they were conducted on four data sets. The first two ones are MNIST and SVHN, their standard computer vision 
uh, data sets. And the second uh, category of data sets we considered was from UCI with some census data for the adult data set where the goal is to predict uh, the income of individuals based on census records. And uh, the final data set was diabetes, USCI diabetes, where given some information about uh, the medical records of patients, we have to predict whether they will be readmitted or not uh, to the hospital in a short period of time. So we, we really tried a vari variety of architectures on these data sets. For the uh, computer vision data sets, we had convolutional networks for the teacher models. And for the student, again, we had GANs uh, because this was the PETA G variant. And for the UCI data sets, we use random forests everywhere for the teachers and the students. So the student were trained in a fully supervised manner. This graph shows you um, the sort of the trade-off between the utility of the aggregated teachers. Uh, so this is before the student is trained and it's the privacy of each of the labels that it predicts. So here, if you consider for uh, MNIST here, this blue line, what happens here on the x-axis is the smaller the values get, the stronger the privacy is. So here we have the strongest privacy. And here we'd like to have the highest accuracy to provide strong utility. So if you only have 10 teachers here, n equals 10, very quickly as you improve the uh, privacy of your uh, aggregated predictions, the utility goes down very quickly. Whereas if you use 100 or 250 teachers here in green and red, you can see that the utility is maintained for much larger values, uh, for very small values of epsilon, which means we have much stronger privacy here and still pretty good utility. And so the same sort of uh, graphs uh, were observed for SVHN. So this means if we use about 250 teachers for MNIST and SVHN, we can achieve a good uh, set of predictions from the teachers that will be helpful for the student to learn, uh, but still provided with very strong uh, privacy here. And what's the uh, sort of uh, metric of interest for us is the trade-off that we have between the student's accuracy and the privacy because the student is the model that we will deploy uh, in FINE. Uh, so here we have a similar graph where uh, the only difference is the y-axis is inverted. So here we have the error rate instead of the accuracy. So smaller values here are better. And here we still have uh, the privacy parameter epsilon. Uh, so again, smaller values are better. Here in this graph, ideally you'd be uh, very close to the origin. So for SVHN, this compares uh, our work to previous work. Um, and you can see we have a great improvement in uh, privacy. So the privacy parameter value is much smaller, which means the privacy is stronger at a very modest cost uh, in uh, the error rate. For the adult data set, we have a slight increase in the uh, guarantees provided in terms of privacy, uh, but we have a strong increase in utility. And finally, on MNIST, we increase both the utility uh, here and the privacy horizontally uh, based on previous work. But what was even more interesting in a sense is that on the UCI diabetes data set, we achieve very good uh, privacy guarantees and the utility of our privacy preserving student here was larger than the non-private uh, baseline. So here this means that by uh, providing uh, privacy, we increased the performance of the uh, machine learning model, which is very interesting uh, in light of uh, a lot of the discussions that are going on uh, between the connections between uh, generalization and privacy. Um, so it seems that enforcing privacy might uh, be beneficial to uh, generalization. So to conclude, I'd like to stress three points. First, uh, our approach is generic, so you can use it with any sort of uh, machine learning technique, including deep neural networks. Uh, second, 
the privacy guarantees can be understood both intuitively uh, through these, these majority votes and rigorously uh, through the differential privacy guarantee. And uh, to conclude, we did see this, uh, these very good trade-offs between utility and privacy uh, for the computer vision data sets and for the UCI data set, we even uh, saw a case where the utility was improved with the privacy preserving techniques. So I'm uh, very excited to see where we can take this work next. So that will be it for today and I'll take any questions that you may have. So one of the questions is, is there a way to ensure that the sensitive information is never leaked from the models? Um, so in our case, uh, when uh, we consider the student model, uh, basically we have uh, rigorous precise guarantees that uh, this model will not uh, leak more information than is allowed by the differential privacy uh, bound. So you can uh, consider the student model as uh, being private in the sense that it will not leak sensitive information. The teacher's model, however, uh, do not have privacy guarantees, uh, but we do not release uh, the teacher models. So another question is, um, what is the biggest challenge uh, with this type of model? Um, I guess the biggest challenge in this, in this approach is how to most effectively transfer the knowledge of the uh, teachers into the students. So because uh, basically every time the teacher to provide some supervision to the students. Uh, so every time the student gets a label from the teachers, um, this increases the price we have to pay in privacy. So really, uh, we are interested in doing this knowledge transfer between the teachers and the student with as little as possible uh, Label. So we, that's why we heavily rely on, on semi-supervised learning where we're able to both learn from the unlabeled data uh, through, for instance, the generative adversarial networks um, and also the supervised data, which the teacher has, the teachers have labeled. Um, in terms of what industries would I recommend these models for? Uh, basically any industry uh, that is training machine learning models uh, on sensitive data and uh, making these models accessible in one way uh, or the other. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, feel free to email me if you have any other follow-up questions. Mm -hmm.